Purdue fans, this is Johnny DeCamp bringing you play-by-play -play the Rouse. Everybody, along with Ron Kramer, this is Pete Van Weeren welcoming you to Ross Aid Stadium. Live from Ross Aid Stadium in West Lafayette, Indiana. It's a football Saturday in West Lafayette, Indiana, and one of the biggest home games in decades. The Rutgers rush the field. What a night in West Lafayette. Your Central Indiana Ford dealers are a proud sponsor of Purdue Football in the Raw Sage Greatest Games podcast. Visit your local Central Indiana Ford dealer today. Welcome to the Raw Sage Greatest Games podcast. I'm Corey Palm with Tim Newton as we celebrate the 100th year of uh, the home of the Boilermakers by recounting some of the greatest games ever played in that stadium. Uh, a few notes before we get started, as always. This list is not comprehensive. Uh, we'd love to go through all the great games with you. We simply don't have the time. Uh, we're also presenting them chronologically and not in any sort of rank order. Um, now that we've got those notes out of the way, Tim, uh, there were so many... The results may vary. Yes. <laughs> so many iconic moments from the 2000 season. That's, what, uh, that's where we're going to go with today's game, that, uh, that October 7th, 2000 matchup with number six Michigan when the Boilermakers uh, took on the Wolverines in, in what was really a savior season kind of a situation. You know, one of the great things about sports is it can take you through so many roller coaster rides and sometimes it's an entire season, sometimes it's a game and it was hard to imagine a more roller coastery ride than what we took that day in, in 2000 because Michigan just came out and punched Purdue in the mouth in the first half. Boilermakers went down big in the locker room, came back, got to where they could hit, kick hopefully a game-winning field goal. They miss it, defense holds, and then Purdue gets one more chance, and we'll actually talk to Travis Dorsch, who did that uh, game-winning field goal a little bit later on. It's going to be a lot of fun talking with uh, with the hero of that game because uh, he had gone through so much. Yeah. And, and part of that is, you know, it has to do, it had to do at the time, with the early season struggles, the Boilermakers – um, what was supposed to be a great season, yeah. uh, high expectations start right around the top 10 uh, preseason polls. They win their first couple games pretty handily and then go up and, and, and lose to a good but not great Notre Dame team Sir. in South Bend um, by two. Yeah, they, they beat Minnesota and then lose to a, well, mediocre is probably kind, uh, a mediocre Penn State team in Happy Valley by two. In a game that had several uh, special teams errors, we shall say, uh, it, it was it was so frustrating. It had a lot of people, including Drew Brees, yeah. publicly stating after the game that some things need to be cleaned up. And if you think I'm talking about you, you're right. Um, it, you know, you come into that game at what three and two, three and two, and you got Michigan and Wisconsin and Ohio State and Northwestern waiting for you in October, and you're thinking, this is, you know, you've put yourself in a position now, if you want to win the Big Ten, which was the goal coming into the season, you really have to run the table. And it starts with Michigan, and so crowd's ready, like, okay, let's get this thing going, and Michigan just ran over Purdue, literally, and threw the ball over Purdue <laughs> all over the field in the first half. Like you said, they got up 14-3 and then intercepted Drew in the end zone to to stifle another Purdue threat. Um Twenty one three after uh, the the original A train Anthony Thomas breaks a long touchdown yeah. run. It's uh, it's actually twenty eight ten at the half. Michigan had the ball four times in the first half. Dude. They drove the distance of the well, they drove eighty plus yards all four times Dude. and ended with touchdowns on all four drives. The one I remember, uh, Purdue had scored. It was twenty one three. Purdue had scored just before halftime, about two minutes left to make it a twenty one ten game. And you're thinking, okay, if you can stop Michigan. They go right down the field, and actually Purdue had held them on third down, and Michigan was going to bring the field goal unit in, but Michigan was called for holding, and Joe Tiller decided to take the penalty and try to drive Michigan out of field goal range. First of all, he wanted to uh, prevent giving up three more points. He also wanted to give the defense a boost of confidence here. Hey, we can stop them. Well, guess what? Michigan scores a touchdown. So instead of getting a field goal, they get a touchdown. They go into the locker room 28-10, and you're thinking, well, Pasadena was a nice thought, but that's not going to happen. There's no way that can happen right now, and and boy was was everyone who said that wrong. The the way the uh, the second half of the season uh, played out, the second half of the game started much better for Purdue. They come out um, a couple rushing touchdowns for the Boilermakers in the third quarter. Steve Ennis and and Montreal Lowe 
Yep. Both find the end zone to make it 28-3 because while the offense was finally finding the end zone, the defense had found its footing. Well, two things in that game. We mentioned the defense and four drives in the first half gave up four touchdowns. Second half, they hold Michigan to three points and 79 yards of total offense. On the flip side, think about this is Michigan's defense. Mm -hmm. Purdue had close to 250 rushing yards that day. Just on the ground. Yeah. With, with Drew Brees. Call and another signals. 286 through the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now Breeze did his part. He had 80 of those rushing yards on right. the day. Sort of a sort of a sneaky part of his game. If 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 you don't remember Drew's college days, he was he was pretty fleet of foot. From what we've grown to get used to seeing him, I, in would, the I would say elusive. elusive. He was a guy that okay. could make the first guy miss, and he also he, he could always buy extra time in the pocket. But he could always make that first guy miss, or at least elude him a little bit, so he could look down the field and. And when he had to, he ran the football pretty effectively. Yep. Now, one thing uh, that actually just came to mind looking at our notes here, Purdue went for two kind yeah. of kind of early, uh, according to the book. They went for two in the third quarter to try and, to try and pull uh, the game a, a, a bit closer at 28-23. They failed in that two-point conversion. This was a bit of a recurring theme. We saw the previous season in, in the Outback Bowl – Going for two came back to bite yeah. the Boilermakers a little bit. Yeah. It didn't here today, but but I think that sort of goes to Coach Joe Tiller's mentality a mm -hmm. little bit, that he's going to do what he thinks right. He's not going to pay attention to some manual that some statistician may have thought up. I'm not sure Joe looked at the two-point conversion chart very often. <laughs> I think it was just a feel with him. And, you know, it was again, it was a case he, he tried to instill in, in at halftime that, hey, we can come back and win this game. And the defense caught on and the, the – the offense really started to run the football, and I think Michigan was a little surprised because you come into that game expecting, well, we're going to have to stop Drew Brees throwing the ball. You don't expect Montreal Lowe to come out and run for more than 120 yards, which he did. He did. He did. Uh, Montreal was great that day. He had several fantastic standout uh, uh, you know, games in the 2000 season. Um, Brees hit Stanford for a touchdown when when the score was 31-23. Uh, yep. Now we are... We're not great at math, but we're good enough at math to know that maybe got to go for two. 31 29, and you got to go for two because yeah. there's yeah. less than five minutes to go in the game. That two point conversion once again failed. Second one of the day. So the uh, Boilermakers uh, get the ball. Uh, they, they have to kick the ball off. Michigan goes three and out. Again, the Purdue defense was stellar in that fourth quarter. Drew takes the offense down inside the 20, and they bring Travis Dorsch out for a field goal of less than 35 yards. Left hash mark. And unfortunately, he hooks it a little bit, and it goes wide of the left upright. Just a little bit, and uh, if if sixty eight ish thousand people could feel deflated, yeah, uh, if you could hear their their collective hopes uh, sort of escape their their heads, uh, that was the feeling in the stadium at, at that moment. The only people who maybe didn't feel that way, the eleven members of the Purdue defense, who said, "You know what? We got a couple timeouts." And we've still got something to say about this outcome. Sometimes when you make a big comeback, it's it's a largely what you do, but you also get a little bit of help. Purdue got some help. Michigan went three and out on their ensuing drive, mm -hmm. including an incomplete pass, which saved the Boilermakers about 30 seconds on the clock, and that came out to be pretty important at the end. And that incomplete pass that happened on third and long, uh, Lloyd Carr, I'm sure, followed the charts almost as much as, as Joe Tiller did. He, he elected to let Drew Henson drop back and and fire a pass across the middle. It went a couple feet high yep. of its intended target. And uh, like you said, saved a lot of time on the clock. Uh, Michigan comes out to punt, try and pin the Boilermakers deep. Um, they got an okay punt, and uh, Vinny Sutherland got a, a pretty good return. Up to the 40-yard line. So you're thinking, okay, no timeouts left, but you got a minute something to go. Um, you've got to get it, you think, at least inside the 30. So you're looking at at least 30 yards here. But again, college football, the clock stops on a first down. And so, as we saw with Drew Brees, he worked his magic in the last couple of minutes. He did. He hit A.T. Simpson uh, for an eight-yard gain. He scrambled for 11 yards on one play, hit hit Vinny and, and uh, John Standiford on back-to-back -back plays yep. to, to get the Boilermakers down inside the 20 once again. And uh, the Boilermakers are out of timeouts at this point. Um, but they're kind of they're kind of collected. They're mm -hmm. they're feeling pretty good about things. Coach Tiller uh, says, "Okay, we're good trying to trying to kick a field goal to win this thing." Hands the ball off to Montreal Lowe to set it up on the left hash. Yep. Eight seconds left, and Travis Dorsch trots back out on the field from almost the exact same spot. 
And this time, the kick, I wouldn't say it was right down the middle, um, but you know what? Could have been down, doesn't matter. It was between the uprights, and the place erupted. Uh, Travis had taken a lot of heat. Now, this is in the days before social media, so um, he did salute the crowd, uh, the student section, that uh, a lot of them had uh, had been on him a little bit after the Outback Bowl the year before, and I think it was just a, a release of the emotions at the time, but Four seconds left, then Purdue just has to kick off and make one final stop, and um, the field was rushed. One of many times in 2000 that the field was rushed for the Boilermakers. I think they had three during the year. The first of three, um, and and no one, not a single student in that student section was angry about being saluted in a particular way by, no, yeah. by the Purdue kicker, that's for sure. Um, that uh, That's how the game played out. Let's, uh, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll have Travis Doors to tell – his vantage point of uh, one of the greatest games in Ross Aid history. Your Central Indiana Ford dealers are a proud sponsor of Purdue football. Visit your local Central Indiana Ford dealer today. We're joined now by Travis Dorsch, the hero of the 32-31 victory over the Wolverines. Uh, Professor Dorsch, yes. great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me, man. That feels like a former lifetime ago, but great to be with you. You know, it's, it it does seem like a long time ago, and a lot has happened then. But how often do you think about not just that game, but that season and and what it meant? I mean, the the month of October in two thousand was was unbelievable from start to finish. Yeah, every every fall, it's hard not to kind of relive those memories. You know, we all we all age a year every fall, but football comes around once again. And I think for all of us that were fortunate enough to be on that team. Uh, that Rose Bowl squad, the the camaraderie, the camaraderie uh, just thinking about the guys, and I see them now and again when I make it back to West Lafayette or sometimes even out on the road, um, the memories do flood back, and I think it'll be a special part of all of us until we die. You, uh, like Tim said, the, the month of October was amazing. Um, we'll, we'll start right there. Game one was number six Michigan coming to Ross Aid to take on the Boilermakers. It was a game that that went back and forth. Now, as a kicker and kicker slash punter, I know you you kept yourself more busy than a lot of specialists did on game days. But uh, what is it like being on the sideline on a game like that, where it's it's kind of kind of back and forth? You guys fight back into it, and 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 everybody's on the edge of their seats. What are you doing during the game? I mean, I think you know every game uh, when you're when you're doing the dual role, you're you're staying ready every possession, right? I mean, because every third down, there's a chance that you're going to be on the field, whether that's punting to try and turn it over, uh, or you're going to be trying to score points with the field goal unit. So I think, uh, you know, it was very busy, and I had to, you know, I had to learn, I had to grow into that throughout my junior and then senior year, figuring out, okay, how much do I actually warm up before the game? How many kicks do I do I waste? Uh, how many do I keep in my leg for for that long three and a half, maybe four hours sometimes? Uh, you know, because it, it really every possession I'm in the net, you know, every 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 third down I'm ready to go. So, you know, Mich the Michigan game wasn't anything different until we get to the last two minutes. And then, of course, the stakes are higher. And uh, and by that time, you've been out on the field counting warm ups in the game. You've been out there for five hours. And uh, there's, of course, a lot of emotions uh, that are tied up and you're trying to just kind of regulate and be calm and be in the moment. But uh uh, wasn't successful the first time, was the second. <laughs> well, let, let's Before we get into that kick, let's talk about the 2000 season coming in because there were such high expectations on this team. You had had a couple of disappointing losses, and you went into that game against Michigan knowing that in order to have a chance to win the Big Ten championship, you really had to win the game. And you go into halftime and you're down 28-10. to 10. Do you remember things that were said or things that you remember from that halftime locker room that, that propelled this team to – really turn the season in a different direction for sure I mean I, I think let's take it all the way back to the Outback Bowl uh the postseason before that you know we, we come off a strong year we get a New Year's Day bull bid we have a strong but young team and uh and we come out really really ripping in the first half and and things fell apart as we know in the second we weren't able to hold that lead against Georgia but I think the seeds were planted at that point in time that hey we got an opportunity now we got Drew coming back. We have an opportunity to be really special. Great pieces around Drew with the offensive line, some of our skill guys, and, and a really strong defense. Uh, so we were really hyped coming into the season. And I think, you know, Coach Tiller helped keep us grounded, helped keep us goal-focused. He was always a, a very goal-driven coach, uh, both at the individual level and at the team level. And uh, and we were very focused on on really trying to maximize our potential that year. We all kind of knew that, like, this is this is where the eggs lie in the basket here. 
in this 2000 season. So um, coming into the year, yeah, great expectations. And then, of course, as we come into that stretch that we knew was going to be a, a huge stretch for us in October, um, starting off with that Michigan game. And then to sort of, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, kind of fall flat in that first half and not play up to our potential. I think we we might have been a bit deer in the headlights there in that first half, all, all three units, offense, defense, and special teams. Um, but what I do remember about the halftime locker room uh, was was an air of confidence, maybe unfounded confidence even, um, that, hey, we, we sort of control our destiny here still. Like, we can play with this team. We can beat this team. We need to figure a few things out on each side of the ball and with our special teams units. And it's going to come down to the last possession. And, and we had faith that uh, you know our defense could hold them, and they did. We had faith that Drew could lead us to some scoring opportunities, and he did. Uh, and, and we had faith that, you know, if I was called upon at the end, um, that I'd have to put it through. And, and fortunately, that happened there at the end. I'm sure that uh, that air of confidence it has to emanate from the top, right? That 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 was Coach Tiller through and through from day one when he got here uh, in 97 and lost his, his first career game as the Purdue head coach. He came out of it saying, we're going to be just fine. That that That's kind of who he always was, isn't it? Yeah, and I think you need that at the top, you know, especially with uh, you know, a school like Purdue where where there might be a little bit of a little brother syndrome, right? They don't have that that storied success over the decades, uh, and you need a leader at the top who can just steal you, um, whether that's bringing you down off a, off a high or, or lifting you up, you know, off a low. And I think he was always that man and that coach for us. And I, you know, you asked earlier about reflecting now as as adults, you know, we think back you know, every fall about our, our experiences. And that's the one thing that when I – and I jump on Facebook and I see all the guys and what they're doing. They all just have this this sort of composure and ability to to grasp that life has its up and ups and downs, uh, and they've all kind of battled through some things. We've all kind of battled through some things, and and to a man, I think the people on that team uh, have demonstrated that they've they've gone out, they've become successful business owners, they've become uh, you know teachers and professors, educators, uh, community servants, all of the like. So. I, you know, aside from all the accolades that came on the field, I, what I think what I'm most proud of is seeing all these guys, me included, have success post-career. And I think that all started, as you said, with, with Coach Tiller and his lessons. Travis, a big part of life is taking advantage of second opportunities. Mm-hmm. And the Michigan game was a prime example. It produced down 31-29. You had a chance with about three minutes to play uh, to put Purdue in the lead, and you just pulled a field goal a little bit wide left. Talk from that point, your 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 mindset or your emotional state going off the field to the fact that about two minutes later, you came back in almost the exact same spot on the field and this time knocked it through. Yeah, you know, being a, a kicker, a punter, a specialist is is a lot like being a golfer. You really have to, more than anything, right, you you all have the physically, physical abilities. I had the physical ability, but you have to be able to regulate the emotions. And I think in a, in a game-winning situation like that, it's like a golfer standing on the 18th tee with a one-stroke lead, right? They're there's a tendency sometimes to let the adrenaline get the better of you. And oftentimes for those that golf know that can lead to a nice snap hook into the woods. Um, so I, I knew, like I knew the minute I missed that first kick, I was like, okay, I know exactly what happened. It wasn't a, a, a physical uh, form type thing. It was just that my body was hyped up for the chance to go, you know, beat Michigan uh, and, and keep our season alive. So I knew, and this is maybe where the roots of my, my sports psychology came into play, um, but I knew that all I needed to do was go to the sideline, calm myself down, wait for the second opportunity. And and I had full confidence it would come. Our defense was playing so well in that second half. Uh, they needed to go out there and get a three and out. They did. Uh, Vinny needed to get some form of a, a punt return on the punt. He did. Drew needed to get us a first down or two. He did. So all the things were falling into place. And then it was up to me to, to go out there and do my job um, as the clock ticked to zero. So Again, I think on the sidelines, I didn't really do much. I didn't even actually touch a ball. I didn't go to the net. I stood right next to uh, Coach Tiller, just just focused on my breathing and relaxation. And when it was my time, I uh, went back out and, and nailed it. Now I'm curious, um, in that play calling, uh, it, driving down the field, sometimes you'll see head coaches who've maybe lost a little faith in their kicker. They'll take a shot at the end zone or a quarterback who will, you know, maybe take a risk to, to try and make a play because they want to, do it themselves, not leave it on on somebody's foot. Uh, your team didn't do that. Your coach didn't call that. Uh, it, does that in the moment instill confidence in you, or is it not in your on your radar? And and not only that, he ran the ball left off tackle yeah. and he put it on the same spot on the exact snatch mark. And, and I think he did it on purpose. Damn it. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
Coach Tiller was always that way. He whether whether he would say it or not, he always had confidence in his guys. He wouldn't have recruited us otherwise. And I remember thinking back three seasons before that to um, fall training camp before we went to USC in 1998, and he pulled me into his office, and I had had a you know training camp battle with Shane Ryan and Scott Kurz and some of the other guys that were already rostered, and he pulled me in and he said, "I have confidence in you. You're going to be our guy for the next four years." You know those things change. I'm sure he says that to a lot of guys, but <laughs> but that moment. You know, that moment meant a lot to me and instilled the confidence in me that I could go out and do the job as a freshman then and then, you know, down the road as a junior and then a senior All-American eventually. So, um, you know, Coach Tiller always, I think, knew how to bring the best out of his guys. And, and so he couldn't recruit with, with the Michigans and the Ohio States, but he'd get the most out of the guys that he could get on campus. And that's why we can compete with those, those big schools. Um, I forget what the original question was. I think it had something to do with play calling leading up to it but I don't even think that entered his mind I think you know to, to coach Tiller every series the goal of every series is to score points and at, at that point down by one or down by two I guess we needed three points so he was coaching to get the, those three points Travis uh, we're going to talk maybe a little bit later about your sports psychology and what you're doing now but this 2000 almost 25 years ago now which is hard to believe social media was not what it is now but still you should you endured more than your share of criticism I think it's safe to say and and you know you're out there on an island sometimes as a kicker the relief that you had after doing that um you know uh you 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 saluted the fans uh, you, you've talked about that a little bit um what how, how was it a, a burden being lifted from your shoulder what was your feeling as you ran off the field that day yeah I mean I, I tell you what um I'm glad social media didn't exist um I, I probably wouldn't have been mature enough in the moment to have dealt with that situation uh, in a good way, uh, nor probably would our fans have been dealing with everything that, that preceded it in a good way. I think there are a lot of great things about social media, but there are some some ills as well. And I think we see it in, in sports and in entertainment. Um, and I, I've, I've actually reached out to a number of young kids, kickers especially, over the last five or ten years as social media has become um, more prominent more ubiquitous. I've reached out to a number of folks who have, have kind of got the raw end of it as I might have 25 years ago. So, you know, I think the only thing that I can do now in my seat is kind of, you know, pay it forward, pay it back, um, and, and take care of the guys who are now coming after me. But yeah, I mean, I think in the moment was your original question. And I think there was just this mix of, of fluid emotions, of course, relief, of course, exultation that we, you know, had seemingly won the game. We still had to kick it off and, and bury the ball, but you know, there, there was all those emotions all in one and still knowing that we had to then flip the page on, on Sunday and get to our, our next opponent, right? This, this was a very meaningful game, but it was still early October. So we had a lot of work left to do and, uh, and we were ready to do that work. And ultimately it, it worked out for us in the long run, but, um, so many emotions. I mean, being a college student athlete brings about all of that. And, and I think that's going back to my comment earlier about why guys now are successful. I think it's because we learn all those easy and hard lessons. Uh, in the trenches, um, you know, some some more than others. Some deal with a lot of hardship, some maybe not so much, but I think we all lean on that now as adults. Uh, let's talk about how you got into uh, what you're doing now. We mentioned Professor Dorsch is your official title because you have been on the faculty at Utah State for about a decade now. Was that something when you came into Purdue, was, was higher education and going in and, and becoming a faculty member on your radar and 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 why did you choose that not not at all actually um you know in, in 2005 when when my or 2006 i guess when my professional playing career was ending and i sort of saw that writing on the wall um there was still some competitive juice in me and i wanted to come back and, and keep achieving i knew there was maybe more for me academically i didn't quite know what that was uh, so i came back to purdue to work on my master's degree uh morgan burke the late morgan burke was was kind enough to um, to make some introductions and get me um, some interviews there in the kinesiology department. And, uh, and of course, I, I had always been interested in, in sport. I was always an athlete, and I was a developmental psychology major as an undergrad at Purdue. So sort of combining the best of both of those worlds um, brought me to this idea of, of sport and exercise psychology. Um, and specifically, my, my focus has always kind of been on understanding the youth sport experience and and how all the different people around an athlete help bring them to to what they can ultimately achieve. Uh, so I so I came back in 2006, kind of on a whim, just to start a master's. 
Uh, and then just like every good story, it started with a girl. I met a girl and, um, <laughs> and decided to stay for my PhD because I surely couldn't, uh, couldn't end up with, with Brie, who's my wife now, surely couldn't end up with Brie and let her have a higher degree than me. So I had to stick around. <laughs> And finish the PhD as well. Competitiveness never goes competitive away. Competitive in the really classroom does. and on the field. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> it's been such a blessing. I mean, I think I really unlocked something that I didn't know I had um, off the playing field. And, um, and, and just the blessings that have unfolded over the past decade as a faculty member and bringing uh, now our family. I'm sitting here with my two kiddos, uh, eight-year-old and six-year-old, uh, bringing us back west. Uh, me being from Montana, my wife from Colorado. So, you know, things come full circle. And I think if you just persevere and stay at it long enough, the right things come into play that, that puts you where you need to be. So i um, very excited on, on where I'm at now and still got a long career ahead of me. That's, that's awesome. I, I know you said, uh, you said you're out there to get some skiing in. That may, that may come as a bit of a, a surprise. We're, we're taping this in June where it's, it's going to air closer to the football season, but uh, uh, you, you still, I know you're still an avid runner. Are, uh, you stay very active and, and I'm sure that's part of your study as well, right? Yeah, we're a very active family. My wife was a college runner. Of course, I played two sports there at Purdue and, and kids are growing up and, and doing everything at the youth level. So we, we do. We, we, we don't let any dust uh, collect on our hats. That's for sure. Um, and we are. We're out here in beautiful Mammoth Mountain, California, uh, doing some skiing this week. They, they, of course, had record snowfall on the West Coast and in the Rocky Mountains this winter. And uh, we're trying to take advantage every bit of it until it melts. As, as an athlete yourself, your wife's an athlete, your kids that you said are playing sports, can you give advice to people who are watching today how they can help their kids maximize and get the best out of a sports experience? What are some things they should do and maybe some things they should not do as their kids get involved in sports? Yeah, Tim, I'm not paid to lecture in the summer. But... <laughs> as long as there's no quiz, we're okay. Right. There's, you know, there's a few things. I think first and foremost, let it be about the kids. I think we as adults oftentimes nowadays are so keen on, on doing the organizing and getting things set up and professionalizing the experience and, and making sure recruiting is involved. And uh, it, it's, it just, it needs to be about the kids, especially at the youngest ages, you know, having those, those conversations around, Hey, what did you enjoy most today? What do you want to do next season? What's your favorite sport? Just these, these engagement opportunities for parents and kids, I think is, is one thing that's really important. Let them play with friends, uh, you know, let them be on teams with their friends because that keeps them coming back. And of course, that's, I think, in the end, the, the most important goal is that we want to create young people who love moving their bodies, love sports in general, become the next generation of, of coaches and mentors in our communities. You know, and then the, the third thing is help, help your kids find things that they're good at. We all want to, none of us want to be terrible at things. So, you know, our bodies are different. We mature at different rates. We have, you know, different heights, weights, skill sets. So sampling enough in the early years to allow our kids to find something that they truly love and then hand them the car keys and, and let them go after it and pursue it. Um, the biggest mistake I see parents make is when the journey is about the parent uh, and not about the kid. Along those lines, too, I think you've been very open that you think students and, and young kids should play as many sports as possible. And we see so much now. Some sports have become 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. And then we wonder yeah. why kids get burned out by the time they're 13 years old. Yeah, the research is you know unequivocal. I think uh, youth need to do as much as they can, sample as many sports as they can, different types of sports, team, individual, open skill, closed skill, you know, all kinds of things. Try it all. Figure out what you love. Figure out what your body is good at. Uh, and then you know, when you get in towards 13, 14, 15 years old, and you've grown into now almost your adult body, then it's the time to sort of maybe put more eggs into one basket or two baskets if you think that uh, there might be some potential to keep competing. But the reality is for most kids, that's not going to be the opportunity. You know, about 2% of high school athletes are going to go on and play in college. About 2% of them are going to go on and play professionally. So, you know, the key is that a kid walks away usually at age 14, 15, or 16 with great experiences, great friendships, great memories, and a skill set that will allow them to, to be active for the rest of their life. Well, Travis, I know you uh, you gave a lot of people great memories throughout your career at Purdue. We we thank you for, for sitting down with us here today and sharing some of those and, and reliving some of it. And who's, who's the better skier, you or your wife? I'm not going to answer that question. I think that answers that question. <laughs> but I will tell you that my, my two kids are better than both of us. That, they are, they are, that, you, you have hit the perfect answer, sir. 
<laughs> they're, they're budding stars. And, and, and thank you for saying that I gave folks great memories. I'm sure I gave them some heartburn as well, but that's all part of, uh, all part of the sport experience. And I wouldn't, wouldn't trade the way it happened for anything. So thanks for having me on guys. You didn't charge any extra for the roller coaster ride. And we thank you for that. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks, Travis.